Good night. Either die too young or you die too old, never die just right. Either die too young or you die too old, never die just right. I hope you see a light. Hope you see a light. What is up, everybody? I hope you're doing well. I hope that life hasn't been too boring. It seems like things are kind of getting back to normal, although here we are. What a strange time. But I do have an announcement about some things. We're going to be making an announcement soon, very soon, about Wednesday nights and kind of what we're doing with that. Um, I'll just give you a spoiler. It's probably going to look a lot like home groups. We'll make an official announcement. None of it's necessarily in stone yet. But yes, an announcement about that. Also, an announcement about summer plans. We're, because of everything going on, uh, just with all of this, and with the rescheduling of things like graduation and prom, uh, we're not going to be doing South Dakota, we're not going to be doing Chicago, we're not going to be doing um, really anything uh, that we normally do. Now, Mina isn't necessarily off the table, and uh, we still are able to go to Mina, and I will have that finalized for you guys, but it might look like the high school takes up maybe half of the week that we have scheduled off for Mina and maybe the middle school will take another half of that week but I will get those details to you guys but that is the week of let's make sure I'm not about to lie to you the entire week is the week of June 22nd through the 26th but we might take half of that for the high school we'll see I'll let I'll let, I'll let you guys know very soon and trying to think, are there any other announcements? Yeah, uh, other than that, I'm excited to have summer. It's going to be different, but I want us just to do some more stuff together, going out and serving in the community. Normally we go to South Dakota and we serve in South Dakota, we serve in Chicago. So this will be a good chance for us to go out and serve in our community. You, if you guys are part of home group, we never got to go out and and reach out to our neighbors and so us being more intentional and doing stuff like that is uh, kind of what I have in mind and us also just getting together and having some fun which it's fun when we get together and serve but yes all right let's open up to the book of John John chapter 3 we're going to be in a very familiar passage today it's John chapter 3 starting in verse 16 you heard that right so let's read it. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will, will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Let's pray. Jesus, let every moment of this time be taken captive by you. Let the thoughts in my head and the words coming out of my mouth and every tiny little bit of meditation in my heart, let it be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, I just ask that you would protect and guide all of these students 
and show them who you are and draw us all nearer to you and give us clarity and vision for how we are to serve you and to serve our neighbors this summer. We love you so much, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, so most of us know John 3.16 by heart with varying different translations. Well, that might be accurate. You know, it, it, it might be more accurate for me to say we all, most of us, know it in our heads. But do we really know it in our hearts? I mean, how loving do you think God is? He's kind of scary, if you ask me. Uh, I, I think we're all pretty intimidated by God. You know, he's this, the big angry man in the sky, just kind of waiting for us to mess up, waiting to destroy us. There's this one moment in the book of Revelation, which was also written by John, where John sees Jesus. It's in the beginning of, of it's in chapter one. And John sees Jesus and Jesus looks glorious and powerful and holy. And as soon as John sees him, he just falls to his face He's a little terrified. John is feeling pretty insignificant in that moment. You know, he's realizing just who Jesus is. Like, starting, just starting to appreciate that this is God. And starting to appreciate who, who, what it means to be God. So he's terrified. He's like on his face, like, oh my goodness. But look at how Jesus responds to John's terror in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. It says, But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Wow. That is rock and roll right there. The Jesus in Revelation is powerful and glorious. But there's something that we miss often. The Jesus in Revelation is the same Jesus as the Jesus in the Gospels. A lot of times people think that Jesus is, is nice and peaceful in round one when he goes to earth and he, he loves us and he heals people and then he dies for us. They think, okay, he was really nice and peaceful then. But when Jesus comes back for round two, that's when he's going to bring the pain. That's when you're going to see his true colors. No, I think we saw his true colors. I think it's so clear that we see his true colors in the gospel. He's always been the same. Same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is just as powerful and glorious here in the Gospel of John as he was and is in Revelation. He showed his power by becoming a servant to the world. His power shined its brightest with his unmatched humbleness. I mean, is that really possible for God to really be so humble, more humble than anyone? Was Jesus really more humble than me or you or anyone on earth could have ever been? Of course he was. The God of the universe is more humble than you. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is more humble than me. You know, we don't have a hard time accepting that God is more powerful than us. We don't have a hard time accepting that God is smarter than us. We certainly don't have a hard time accepting that God is bigger than us. But it absolutely crushes and terrifies my soul to realize that God is more humble than me. That there are things that I think are beneath me that God has never thought were beneath him as he stoops down to wash his betrayer's feet. And if God is more humble than me, then I suppose he's more everything good than me. You know, he certainly isn't more bad than me. He's, he's not more wicked than me because God isn't wicked, nor is he at all evil. He is good. He is truth. So he's certainly not more false than me. 
And I believe we can all be quite false. We can all be quite fake. But God is never fake. And he's always true. Always much more true than me or you. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Okay? So is, think, think about this. Is Jesus telling me to do something that is beyond his love? You know, many times we kind of think that. We think, yeah, God tells me to, to love my enemies. God tells us to love our enemies. But God doesn't have to love his enemies. In fact, God hates his enemies. Double standards? But isn't it godly for me to love my enemies? Isn't it Christ-like for me to love my enemies? So does God have this double standard where he tells me to love my enemies, but he gets to hate his enemies? Do I love more than God? Certainly not. Surely not. Look at the life of Jesus. Again, that is God revealed. Everyone has all their ideas of who God is. You look to Jesus. And that's what John teaches us all throughout this book. You look to Jesus. That's when you learn exactly who God is. Look at the life of Jesus. All, all he ever did was love his enemies. Look at the death of Jesus. One last amazing, universe-changing act of love for his enemies. Yet yeah, God is more loving than me, or you. God is more humble than me. He's more loving than me. What about forgiving? What about forgiveness? In Matthew chapter 18, Peter asks Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not just seven times, but seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. Jesus wasn't saying that you forgive someone 490 times and then you stop forgiving them right at 491 times. You're like, ah, you have run it dry, dude. No, he's not saying that. He, he's expressing to Peter that, hey man, your forgiveness for, for your brother who's sinning against you, your forgiveness against him should be unlimited. Unlimited, far more than you than you expect. Much more unlimited. If Jesus asks me to forgive the person who sins against me seventy times seven, or an unlimited amount, if He's asking me to forgive someone an unlimited amount, even if they're sinning against me, does that mean that I am more forgiving than God? Is 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 God less forgiving than that? No. Of course not. Think about this. Because apart from God, I would never love. Apart from God, I would never be humble. And apart from God, I would certainly never forgive. Because all of that comes from God. Think about this. The very existence, the very truth of love and humbleness and forgiveness. Like, can you, can you identify love and humbleness and forgiveness in the world? That startled me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so, the <laughs> can you identify love, humbleness, and forgiveness in this world? Can you, can you think of examples of, okay, there's an example of love, there's an example of someone being humble, there's an, an example of someone forgiving. The very truth and existence of those things is more than enough evidence that God is ever-present and truly, truly real. Because we cannot get love, humbleness, and forgiveness without God. The very existence of faith shows that God must be real. Because faith comes from God. If you see water, it came from somewhere. We learn how to be humble from God. We learn how to love, how to forgive from God. What else? Is God kinder than me? Is God more fair than me? Does God have more compassion than I do? Does God care more than I care? Is God more generous generous than me? Yes. Look to Jesus, and it is impossible to deny all of those truths. He is more 
all of that than us. It's kind of surprising. It's not really something you think about much, but, but you can't think about this enough. Can you really exaggerate how much God loves you? And if you think you can, then you're missing it. Can you exaggerate how much He loves you? Can you exaggerate how humble He is? How forgiving and kind and fair and compassionate and caring and generous He is? You think, oh, well, but surely I can exaggerate how generous He is. I mean, yes, he, he gives me everything, every heartbeat and breath and everything, but it's not like He would ever give everything to me and put me above Himself. It's like, oh, well, actually, yeah, of course He does. He, he literally gives His life for you and becomes a servant to you. He, he puts you above Him. Oh, you can't exaggerate how good God is. But we paint a, a much different picture of God in, in our heads. He's upset with us. He's angry with us. He's very disappointed. And he will only be happy if he can punish us forever. For many people, he is a needy bully. Just a needy, insecure bully. Abusive. For many of us, we have come to see John 3.16 not as, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, but rather we see it as, For God so hated the world that He had to murder His only Son in order to calm down His rage. Without realizing it, I think many of us, if not all of us, have had this view, or maybe you still have this view. It's as if God is just an abusive father. I mean, that's what it sounds like. God's just an abusive father who is determined to kill you. But luckily, like as God is raising his hand to, to strike you, his son steps in and is like, No! Wait, Dad! Please don't do it! And then God just beats his son. And, and he beats his son to a pulp and he looks at you and he says, Do you accept this? Do you accept this? See what you did? And if you don't say yes, if you don't say yes, I accept it, then he's going to beat you up for eternity once he regains his energy. That's strange. Is that really who God is? Look to Jesus. Look at the verse again. It's not for God so hated the world that he had to murder his son. It's for God so loved, so loved the world, the world. It's not that God so loved good people. Read the Bible. Every time the world is mentioned, it's talking about all the bad people. For God so loved all the bad people that he sent his son. Verse 18, Jesus says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. He didn't come to judge us. He came to save us. We already judged ourselves. We have already condemned ourselves. It says in the next verse, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Okay. So, do we need to feed God's pride by believing in Him, or else we're going to get punished? Look at verses 19 and 20. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. Here's the thing. Jesus didn't come to save us from going to hell. Jesus didn't go down to the earth to save us from going to hell. Think about this. He wasn't trying to save us from going anywhere. He came to save us from where we already were. He comes to save you for where you already are. 
We're much closer to hell than we realize. It's not the flames of hell that are scary. It's the darkness. Not just dark, but like the darkness, the absence of light. And not just light, the absence of true light, the absence of God. Which, that's a place so often where we want our lives to be. In that very place. And we're afraid of flames. When we should, we should be afraid of our own darkness. He didn't, he didn't come just to save us from going somewhere. He came to save you from where, exactly where you're at right now. He came to save us from the darkness that we were already in. He, he came to shine the light in the darkness. And if you want nothing to do with the light, then, yeah, then you'll remain in the dark. We do it to ourselves. Jesus said that we're afraid. We're afraid of our sins being exposed. So we keep our sins in the dark. We think, oh, this is, this is just so bad. This is so terrible. And Jesus isn't surprised by your sin. But we keep it in the dark. And that's, in, in the dark is where our, 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 our sins just grow beyond our control. And all of a sudden, bitterness just overwhelms us. Jealousy overwhelms us. Lust overwhelms us. Greed overcomes us. It's never too late to bring your sin in the light. What does that look like? I mean, it looks like confession. When was the last time you just confessed your sin to God? Like, oh, I did that when I was a kid at VBS. Do it again. Confess to Him the sin. When was the last time you were just honest and open about your struggles, about your darkness with God? Yeah, God is an intimate. He's intimidating. But remember Jesus' words to John in Revelation when He said, Hey, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He placed His right hand on His shoulder. He's like, Hey, don't be afraid. He's more understanding than you wish He was. Look at the last verse, verse 21. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Now, that isn't saying that when we come to Jesus, we just, we brag. We're like, see everyone, see how I'm doing everything right and you're doing everything wrong because now I got my Jesus swag on. That's not what's happening. It's not about just bragging about, see, I do things right, but look at all you sinners doing everything wrong. This is saying that when you come to the light of Jesus, you begin to be the person that God always intended you to be. And then the world around you sees that. They see how Jesus has changed your life. And, it's, and, and, and it begins to call them out of the darkness as they see the light shining off of you. So you got to ask yourselves, we have to ask ourselves, is my life being shaped by Jesus? Is it? Have I gotten alone with him? Am I, am, am I seeking to follow him and represent him in every moment? Now, <laughs> Here's the thing. You can't represent something you never really knew. I I know nothing about the NFL. And I could try. I could wear like a jersey of a player. And I could try to represent the team and the player well. But I don't really know anything about it. So yeah, you got to get to know Jesus. You got to get to know who it is that you represent. Who it is that you are that you are following I can't follow someone that I never that, that that I know nothing about. So yeah, you you need to meet with Jesus and follow him and represent him and imitate him. You don't have to convince people that that they're in darkness. You don't. You don't have to convince them like you don't understand like you're a sinner, you got all this stuff. You don't have to convince them that they're in darkness. Just show them the light. They'll see. Show them the light of Jesus. It's hard to, to, to deny. 
a light piercing the darkness. Take time tonight, all right? Take time tonight to confess your sins. For real, do it. To confess your sins to Him. Get alone, close the door, and just be still. Don't worry about, all right, dear Father, I just uh, hope I have a good day. Lord, just help this, and just I really hope that... I uh, really hope that I can still make it to prom, and uh, Lord, I just please help, even though I'm, I'm like a freshman, and, and I'm definitely not going to go to prom, I just really hope I can make it to prom, Lord, just please thank you, Lord, I just thank you so much, I just want to have a good day, just, you know, um, and uh, bless the troops, amen. Um, sh sometimes you got to shut up, okay? Get alone. Maybe you need to read this passage again, and be still, and think about who Jesus is. Ask Him. Ask Jesus to lead you. Lord, I give you my life. Lead me in your light. You can't go wrong with that. Everyone should do that. You can't do it enough. Alright? Well, I hope you guys have a great night. And I will be talking to you soon. Peace out. Bye, everyone. Hope you see a light Hope you see a light I hope you see it Never clearer in my mind You're never nearer